Somebody could show up in our town right now. And um, if they could just preach the word, they could put people on pews, sing a hymn with an old lady at a piano and grow their church. Um, because people are emaciated. People are looking for food. And we have a church and a country that is doctrinally emaciated. And so any appetizer of the word of God and people will grow Welcome to The Great Awakening. I'm your host, Josh Dawes. My guest today is Stephen Whitlow. He is the pastor of Redemption Church in Toledo, Ohio, and the founder of Clear Truth Media, a wonderful media company that started earlier this year. Jamie Brant Bambrick, who was uh, a guest on the show, uh, is the editor-in-chief over there. They do great video content, great written content. And Stephen uh, recently published uh, a couple of pieces uh, all about his experience as a megachurch pastor for the last 20 years. And uh, I read those and just knew I had to have him on the show to discuss. We have a very similar background, having kind of uh, cut our teeth and grown up in that ministry world and have come to a lot of the same conclusions about um, some problems and unintended consequences that um, from that movement that have really left the church struggling to adjust to this negative world we find ourselves in. So it's a great conversation. We talk a lot about uh, what can come next, what what to you know take from the megachurch movement, what we can learn from that, and what to kind of let go of, and and what ministry might look like uh, in the coming years in in negative world. So it's a great conversation. I think you're really going to enjoy it. But before we jump into that, I would love to tell you about a new sponsor. As a husband, father, and someone who absolutely loves board games, I'm always on the lookout for fun ways to connect with my family. But let's be real, finding a game that's challenging enough for mom and dad while still being engaging and fun for the kids can feel impossible. That's why I'm thrilled to tell you about a new card game I think you'll love, Escape Master. Escape Master is a fast-paced fantasy card game that blends the excitement of classic speed mechanics with immersive fantasy lore. It's designed to keep the whole family engaged, a quick enough uh, game for the kids to jump into, but with enough strategy to keep adults coming back for more. This is a brainchild of Zach and Lily, the husband and wife team behind Zilly Creative Works, the small Christian startup. They've created this game with Christian families like ours in mind, and it's now live on Kickstarter. You can pre-order it today and unlock years of family fun for the price of a basic men's haircut. By supporting Escape Master on Kickstarter, not only are you getting a fantastic game, but you're also helping launch a new Christian company into the world of tabletop gaming. For more details, head over to zillycreativeworks.com, that's Z-I-L-Y, or visit their Kickstarter page using the link in the show notes. Get Escape Master today and start creating memories with your family around the game table. I am really excited about this. It looks like a ton of fun. So definitely go and check that out. All right. Now let's jump right into my conversation with Stephen. Hey, Stephen. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Josh. Looking forward to it. I have uh, become a fan of yours in the last over the last uh, couple months of, as I've gotten to know you through uh, the Clear Truth Media launch and some of your writings there. And I, I feel like we've got a, a uh, we're kind of uh, kindred spirits. We've got a lot of uh, similar backgrounds and have come to a lot of the same conclusions. But for our audience who's just getting to know you, can you give us a little bit of who you are and and what's your relation to megachurches, which is what we're going to talk about? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. So my uh, relationship with the megachurch is it's an interesting one. I grew up in the Assemblies of God. And so back then in the 90s, that was pretty traditional denominational church, not traditional in the sense of like, uh, you know, one of the main lines, but more traditional in the, in the sense of traditional church, right? So you always dressed up and you sat in pews and, and, you know, set doctrine because it was a denomination. And uh, when I was uh, growing up in the assemblies of God, the mega church movement was just kind of beginning. And it was really kind of the joke in town. If you went to the mega church style church, like you went to fake church, that was church for people who didn't really want to go to church. And uh, I went to uh, a Christian school here in town. It was the biggest Christian school. And so like every church in town was represented in that, uh, including the mega church and, and his family, the mega church pastor's family. So, uh, you know, they were kind of the brunt of our, you know, middle school church jokes. 
uh, you know, for fake church and all of that kind of stuff. But as luck would have it, uh, our Assemblies of God church had some church drama, which churches are prone to do. And uh, my family found itself on the the wrong side of the church drama. So we were church shopping. And uh, in the early 2000s, where that left us was trying out the local mega church. And so at that point in time, uh, the the church in in I'm in Toledo, Ohio, uh, and so the church is called Cedar Creek, still exists today. And um, the Creek, obviously, direct descendant here from Willow Creek, our founding pastor, um, who's a man I have the utmost respect for. Loved lost people, loved the Word of God. Ended up becoming my boss for for eight years, um, and is just a great man of the Lord. Um, he was working in Chicago, uh, in uh, downtown Chicago in the Sears building, went to a Willow Creek leadership summit or something like that. And the idea of planting a church took over his heart. And so he moved back home, planted this church in 1994. By 2001, they had grown to a couple thousand. They had built a 50,000 square foot building, you know, biggest church in the city, fastest growing church ever. And we ended up there. And I remember joking uh, that I was the nicest dressed person in the room. You know, I was probably 15 years old. And I remember the pastor, he threw out M&Ms the first day. And I'm like, what is this growing up in the assemblies of God? And so that's when I first, I'll say, fell in love with the mega church. I was a sophomore in high school and um, we ended up sticking around there. And before I left for college, um, the youth pastor said, hey, if you ever want to go into ministry and do an internship, let me know. And at that point in time, I wanted to run for office and and make a billion dollars and then run for office. So I went off to Hillsdale College to major in international business and poli sci and uh, went to Hillsdale. And about um, halfway through my sophomore year, I just realized I wanted to go into ministry. So I took him up on that call and uh, called him up, said, hey, I want to do an internship. I moved back home and started interning at the mega church. So Inch. That's my that's my start. That's how I got there. Yeah, uh, very similar. I I mean, I grew up a uh, pastor's kid in a Southern Baptist church, okay. very traditional. We had all the pews. Uh, even when I was real young, we had the little plaque on the wall that had you know <laughs> how much giving last week yeah. in Sunday school attendance and all of that. Um, sure. And uh, you know, church for me growing up was um, it was a community. It was you know we had great you know congregations that. Uh, we loved and great fellowship, but it was it was not a place where you really wanted to invite your friends to because, <laughs> yep. you know, you don't know who's going to be doing the special music and it might be really bad and uh, really bad. You know, you don't you don't know if the, the sermon's going to be, um, you know, something that pushes people away. And so when I got to college, um, I went to Georgia Tech. Uh, there's Little church was starting about that time, um, you know, with Charles Stanley's son, Andy. And uh, I knew Charles Stanley because, you know, we were good Southern Baptist. And Andy was uh, was uh, coming up. He was the, um, you know, started, I think, with 3000 one Sunday. But uh, they were hosting a uh, Bible study on Tuesday nights for singles uh, oh. called 722. And Louis Giglio was the pastor there. And the same kind of experience. I went there just like, okay, um, let's check this out. And I just fell in love with it. It was just, it was cool. It was hip. The music was great. The messages were incredibly relevant and applicable to my life and my friends' lives. And I felt, you know, oh, I can invite people here. You know, this, this, mm -hmm. the people I see here are the people I want to reach. And I just fell in love with it. Uh, after college, uh, my wife and I both ended up working at Andy's church for, um, you know, probably almost 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, it was, um, it, yeah, it was very formative for us in how we approached yep. ministry, how we thought about ministry. Um, before we get into some of kind of the things we've learned, you know, given hindsight, what are some things that you think, there's still a lot of people that, look at the mega church model they never experienced it and they still you know kind of ridicule it and have negative thoughts about it what do yeah. people get wrong about the mega church in your yeah. your opinion so i'm going to specifically speak to the mega church as we've defined it over the last 20 years or so um, and maybe contrast that slightly with the perversions that we've seen since 2020 um, but if we embrace it or look at the mega church as a whole from the mid 90s into 2020, 
and say, what were the things that were great about the mega church? Um, first, I would say this, the people in the mega church were super nice. They loved being at church. Um, they enjoyed it. They were joyful. I still remember for the first two months, I thought the greeter at the front door owned the place. I, I mean, he was there every single weekend. He had this huge smile on his face. Uh, he always, um, you know, he remembered names, even though there were hundreds or thousands of people walking in. I mean, it was a powerful, powerful um, experience having come out of what I would call obligatory church. And um, I, I don't want to bemoan my childhood pastor. I think he was a faithful man, um, but church was not fun. And in the mega church, church was fun. And I will also say between those period of time, uh, that period of time, those 25 years, the, the, most of the pastors were unbelievably faithful to the word. Um, I know the church that we were at, they were faithful to the word and they were building off of a foundation of people who had been pretty well doctrinally trained. And then they were now teaching topical sermons, um, off of that doctrinal foundation. And it was really refreshing and, um, and it was, um, biblically centric. And then also there was an unbelievable heart for the lost. Um, I was reviewing this today, actually, with my my church staff team. Um, for the most of the time that I was at Cedar Creek, our mission statement was to help spiritually restless and unchurched people love Jesus, serve others, and become fully devoted followers of Christ. This this was not some aim at making like low level disciples. the The aim was to make people and form people who sold out to Christ. And um, when I left the mega church, people would always say, "Well, you know, the mega church it never created a full disciple of Christ." And I would always kind of go, I mean, it made me, it formed me. Uh, and so if you don't think I'm a mature follower of Christ, like you should probably go to a different church uh, because a lot of my discipleship came out of that era. And I think people misunderstood that. Um, I think people have given a lot of ill intent to the mega church that I don't actually think was part of the original plan. I think it was for many people. Now, Maybe take Bill Hybels out of this, who knows? Um, but I think a lot of the descendants, um, they were well-intentioned. They just wanted to see lost people come to Christ, and they wanted to see people excited about the gospel and excited about going to church again. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That was, that was what drew me. It was like, I, I loved the heart for evangelism. And I, I think, um, you know, for so much... And I think this goes all the way back to Finney, like even the, the prior, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the altar calls and the old traditional method, it was all about like, but we've, we've got the responsibility of making conversions. We've got to get people to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated that the mega church seemed to s fall back on more of a, a slow sell. Like, let's not, <laughs> let's not create these manipulative um, situations yep. but it was still about let's we it's our is up to us and so what can we do to change to make the church more attractive um which you know i've got a lot of problems with now looking back um but mm -hmm. the heart of it is was was to reach people and i've always appreciated that i always uh, appreciated that at, uh, at north point uh with andy about once a year he would tell people like look if you're not volunteering if you're not about the mission here uh, then get up. You're taking a seat that that we'd rather mm -hmm. you know have available for the unchurched to come, and and there was there was this this very real push and excitement amongst the people in the congregation that we get to be a part of what God's doing. We get to be, be a part of something exciting that is is proven to help you know bring people closer to Jesus, and 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 that you know I think uh, it still goes for a lot of people that are in some of these churches where we would have problems with kind of the trajectory of some of the leadership of it. So I'm always very quick to, you know, um, I guess caveat my criticisms of, of, of these churches and their, the, the people that attend these churches, because I know that a lot of them really do have good motivations. Well, I think if you look at the different pillars of American evangelicalism, uh, the charismatics and the, and the quasi charismatics, they love to talk about revival. They love to talk about cities coming to Christ. And I remember sitting in conversations with the charismatics in our city talking about revival and asking the question, hey, would it be amazing if 100 people got baptized? Would it be amazing if 500 people got baptized and nodding their head? And yeah, that'd be amazing. I said, okay, 
La the last year I left Cedar Creek, we baptized 2,000 people. And yet you guys are here trying to create strategies on how to baptize 50, how to win 100. And, but you're putting down, and the person who's not in the room are the people leading the churches that are baptizing hundreds or thousands every single year. And, and so at what point in time do you stop and go, maybe methods matter? Uh, maybe, I mean, it was your guy, Andy, who used to say, um, you know, ask the question, what methods does God seem to be inspiring or anointing right now? Uh, as opposed to trying to, to, you know, figure out where's the anointing? We say, well, what's working? Uh, maybe that's where it is. And yes, we can look at unintended consequences. That's what I've done in some of my articles and videos. Um, but unintended consequences are usually only brought up after success. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's let's shift into those unintended consequences. We've both spent a lot of time in that yeah. world. And now we're both critical of, of kind of where it is it is it is led to. Um uh, where, what, what are some of the problems you're seeing and when did you first start to see those? Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if in mega church world, you call this being red pilled, white pilled, purple pilled or what, but I think my first moment was, uh, I was sitting in a, what we called our management team meeting. There are 13 of us on this team. Um, at this point in time, the church was nearing 10,000. We had five campuses. I'm 25 years old, you know, preaching during the weekend service occasionally um, overseeing what we basically one of our departments at the multiple campuses. And I remember sitting in this meeting, we had probably 140, 150 people on staff. And, and so there's 13 of us in this. And, um, and I, I remember asking the question we've had, the church was just turning 18. I said, okay, so we've had some of our kids for 18 years. What do they know? What, if we sat them down and gave them a not even a theology quiz. Let's just give them a Bible basics quiz. What do they know? And uh, let alone if we gave them a doctrinal quiz. And, um, and the answer was they knew our mission statement. They knew where the pop was. And they knew that they were supposed to be excited at certain times around the year to invite people to church. Uh, and they know that they should serve and give and invite. Um, but that is not a faith that is sustainable long term. And it's not a faith that is sustainable with every wind of doctrine that Paul would warn us about. And so that was my first kind of early, wow, there's something wrong here. And I started developing something inside of me that was trying to be respectful to the environment that I was in, especially out of my respect for the founding pastor and my boss, um, that as long as I'm here, I'm going to, um, I'm going to be a team player. I'm going to ask the right questions, um, but I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to create division. But if I were to ever lead a church, I would probably do some things a little bit differently. And so I think that's what started me on my post mega church journey. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it was we had we'd been there long enough that we started to see the same, you know, series cycled in, you know, periodically every yeah. 18 months. You're going to do the finances, the marriage, the parenting. And we kept coming back to the same. And so my wife and I were just feeling a little kind of starved for deeper theological teaching. And that's, yeah. you know, how we discovered Mark Which Driscoll like and Tim Keller and, and all these other. Yeah, <laughs> we discovered all these like great teachers that really helped us that were going a little bit deeper in their teaching. And so we're like, that's fine. You know, the church Sunday morning, it was drilled into us. This is not for us. This is for the unbeliever that's going to be there, that, that those people that you're investing and inviting. That this is for them. And they had this model, the four year to kitchen model and the, the big service on Sunday morning. That was the four year. That's where you welcome people into your home. And the point of that, you know, four year to kitchen was to kind of gradually lead people into smaller and smaller environments where they can really get deep and the real spiritual growth happens. And so that was small groups for us. And and so I'd always kind of, you know, I, I wasn't sure about this model. But there was a point where uh, I think it was after Willow Creek had their reveal study that was um, it was this kind of uh, earth shattering uh, study that came out, you know, I think mid 2000s um, that they had uh, conducted with their life groups that just determined that, hey, our people aren't growing in their faith. The, the, the small group model is not working. And um, I think in the wake of that, uh, we stopped talking as much about the foyer to kitchen and kind of began to look at the small group was also a four-year environment. 
And so, you know, some people may feel more comfortable starting at a small group thing. And so everything began to be focused towards outsiders, even those spaces that were previously reserved for like, this is where we get into the nitty gritty of the faith. And for me, that was just kind of the first like, where is that, that deep discipleship happening now? Is that just a solely a personal um, thing that's your, your own responsibility? Is there no role for the the church leadership to have in shepherding and equipping in that way. And that, that, that first began to, you know, ring the, the alarm bells for me. Well, you um, are, you, you're correct in that the, the mantra there was discipleship is, is your job. And if you're not growing spiritually, um, you're not serving in a meaningful way, or you must not be reading the Bible on your own. And listen, serving and reading the Bible on your own, having a private devotional life is a good thing, but you can't have an accurate reading of the New Testament and not see the importance of, of teaching and preaching. And that's where the statement that was circulating the internet just a couple of days ago, uh, you know, rows, uh, circles instead of rows. And, and it came out of that, that somehow these circles of untrained people um, having casual conversations in someone's living room while there's 14 kids screaming is going to be the best discipleship outlet ever. And uh, it, 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 it was a broken model that was destined to fail. And the reveal survey revealed it. Um, but even though it revealed it, um, it's like we didn't really change course much. I mean, it, nothing, nothing got fixed. Yeah. Now you, this was something I hadn't picked up on until I, I read your, your piece on the, the four, uh, yeah. unintended consequences, uh, the, you, you said it earlier, um, discipleship was basically, you need to give, you need to, uh, serve and you need to invite, um, looking at some people that attend, you know, more reformed or more serious churches, uh, a lot of them sit on their butt and consume the the good you know uh, expositional preaching and and are not uh, as you know committed to a mission what's the problem with that that model that that framework for uh discipleship so it's built around the entire idea of the statement that Hybels made famous the church is the hope of the world and so if the church is the hope of the world then we should lay everything down for it and, and what does it take to make a church continue to function and thrive? It takes giving, it takes serving, and it takes inviting. And so our discipleship was geared toward creating cogs in the machine. And, uh, and so those are the three things that are essential. And if you're really spiritually mature, then you do the daily devotional and you enter into a life group. Um, but level one discipleship is about being a good church goer. And discipleship really as a whole, um, I, in our church, we teach there are six metrics or kind of six measurements of discipleship. And one of them is church engagement, uh, but that's just one of six. And but in the megachurch era, we made church engagement the primary function of your measurement of, um, of spiritual maturity. And you even look at the, the next steps class or growth track, all of that kind of stuff that became popular and is still popular. What do those things do? They get people to give, serve, and invite um, because it perpetuates the machine. And so when you understand the entirety of what was going on, it makes perfect sense that you would train people to participate in the machine. The problem is in 2020, we realize that a discipleship based on give, serve, and invite doesn't uh, doesn't work when you can't show up. Um, and so you can't serve and there's literally nothing to invite somebody to. Mm -hmm. um, and what COVID did is it just kind of revealed if our entire discipleship is gauged uh, based around uh, give, serve and invite. And, and what happens if the church can't meet on Sunday? Well, people walk away from their faith. Uh, people follow any wind of doctrine um, and or people are really at a crisis. Because like, well, my entire Christian faith is built around giving, serving, and inviting, and I can't do those mm -hmm. things anymore. Uh, and so what do I do? Now, you also hit on it earlier. There was something tangibly exciting about being a part of the mega church. If you had grown up in a, in a stodgy denominational church, you hadn't seen anyone come to Christ. Um, the only church growth was when somebody moved into town or when somebody had a baby. Um, then when 
um, you're in a church and you're adding services or you're launching new campuses and literally thousands of people are showing up on the first day, or you have an ad campaign in the fall and 400 people show up new, there's excitement there. Mm -hmm. And so you wanted to play your role, give, serve, invite, contrast that. Uh, a lot of the people in my church that come out of the reform circles um, and, and our church crosses the denominational spectrum, they're really bad church attenders. They, they don't, I mean, a lot of them don't give. Um, uh, um, most of them don't serve and none of them invite people to church because that's just not something you do often in those circles. Right. Uh, and so I love it when, when I have ex mega churches show up because I'm like, oh gosh, they're going to join a serving team in like three weeks. I actually have to like <laughs> slow them down. Right. Like, Hey, you don't need to just like switch jerseys real quick. Like take a breather, you know, learn who we are. We do some things differently. Uh, but they've been so trained. If I am a mature follower of Christ, I have to be giving, serving, and inviting. It's not bad. It is bad when it is the entirety of your your sanctification. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you're talking about the the circles and the rows, there were mm -hmm. so many of those like phrases that just yeah. kind of like well, come on, man, they came right out of Georgia. <laughs> they did. He was the math. He was the master. He was so good at, at taking, he still is, at taking yep. a concept and making it sticky. I, I still tell people and my kids all the time, unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude. If you're not telling someone you appreciate <laughs> them, they interpret it as that you're ungrateful. Do, do you tell your kids to listen and learn and go further faster? Oh, no, I haven't done that one. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, th but there's so many of those. And I yep. was, you know, seeing those those compilations um, go around. Uh, I think I saw another one. You know, you've never seen church like this. <laughs> uh, this isn't the church you grew up with. The problem is mm -hmm. now it is for most people. It's like, what are you talking about? You're yes. just saying a line. And this is like the last four churches I attend. Um, yep. I, I, I wonder if you've thought much about how that sort of kind of um, mimicry that occurs within the mega church system, um, how that kind of let in a lot of the, you know, woke ideology that we've seen uh, show up in churches. Like, it seems to me that like, once one, you know, large platform guy is saying it, it just spread through the church super fast because of that, those, those, you know, mimesis uh, pathways have already been formed with all of the other language that, you know, passes around. Yeah, I think that's that's right on. Um, in you know, when I was um, growing up in the mega church, we did a series called "This Is Not Your Mother's Church," <laughs> and it was a super famous campaign for the church, and we grew a lot and all that kind of stuff. But the church I pastor now, we we just did a series last year called "This Is Your Grandmother's Church," <laughs> um, because to show that there is, we're reverting back. I often say my job right now as a pastor is to make church look more like the '80s and the '90s. Um, and to bring back a lot of those things that we threw out during the last 25 years of church. But to your point, part of the way the megachurch, and this is this, uh, there's a lot of things that, that play into this, but understanding the full scope of it helps us understand. And so in, in the megachurch, um, this kind of social club environment began to be formed. And, and the club was brand loyalty. You fell in love with your megachurch. Mm -hmm. um, prior to the megachurch movement, you didn't hear people saying, Oh my goodness, I just love my church so much. I love my church. I love being there. I I love the messages. I love the service. I love, love, love. It even became popular during the megachurch era to uh, at the end of a baptism series to hear somebody say, so and so blank megachurch changed my life. And you're like, whoa, no, hopefully Jesus changed your life, not your megachurch. It's not bad to love your church. But the brand loyalty mm -hmm. to the mega church um, was was so strong that one of the unintended rules that emerged was you never question the platform mm -hmm. ever, um, and to question the platform is to show brand disloyalty. And um, in in when we say the mega church, the individual churches were a microcosm of what was happening in the broader megachurch. And so if you don't question the megachurch within your own megachurch, 
you also, if you're a smaller megachurch style pastor, don't question the larger megachurch style guys. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if numeric attendance on Sunday morning is the only measure of success, which it was just look at the outreach 100 magazines every week, then whoever has the biggest is the wisest and whatever they're saying you fall in line to. And so we saw this through the leadership summit, through catalyst, through the passion conferences, through all of the industries that were created out of it. Um, and, and, and it wasn't that there wasn't celebrity Christian before. Um, but if you take, um, the, all of the things that were converging together. So the, the rise of the mega church, um, the launch of social media, um, the way it was easier to spread messages digitally, um, the affordability of travel to go to these conferences at younger and younger ages, um, you know, all of those things, it bred into creating the celebrity culture. And when you tie into that celebrity platform culture with the unspoken rule of thou shalt never question the stage, well, whatever the stage goes, uh, it says goes. And so when the stage says, get a shot, get a shot. When the stage says, bow to BLM, bow to BLM. When the stage says, vote Democrat, vote Democrat. Wh whatever the stage says, you have to do it or in your own megachurch or in the megachurch world, you are kicked out of the club. Yeah. And that, and that loyalty is so still strong. Like I, I've got good yep. friends that are still at Andy's church uh, with all of the same objections I have to his recent teachings and, and where he's yep. gone the last few years. But that loyalty is, is just so strong because this is where my, my kids got saved. This is where my mother-in-law started coming back to church. This is where, you know, my neighbor um, came and we're in a small group and, and it's just, there's so much tied up into, and, and I think that gets back to that discipleship model that like, where, who am I as a Christian, if not a member of North Point? or an attender of North Point. Yeah. Um, it, 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 that's just, yeah, that's so disturbing. <laughs> well, and what happens when you, what happens when you either get kicked out or you leave the club? Mm -hmm. um, your name is tarnished. Your reputation is destroyed. <laughs> and it's not just the question of your church attendance. It's a question of your very faith. Like, oh, I think they might have, I think they, I think they might have left the faith. And like, no, mm -hmm. they just went to a different church. Um, and because it's all built around and, and the brand of your mega church and your, your Christian faith, you're right. They became synonymous. And again, it is good to like your church. Uh, it's not a bad thing. That's why I would call these unintended consequences, but you see how the entire system was set up to make it, um, as, as entrenched as it was. And it is, but I, I, I drive around my town now during political season and I see these big Trump fant signs with the, um, the mega church, um, you know, um, yard signs out front. And I just, I like hit my head because I'm like, this is so funny. Like, like, you know, these, a lot of these mega churches are, have become like kind of these like, you know, bastions of liberal thought. Mm -hmm. uh, but you still see that in those churches yep. are people who are politically and theologically conservative, but the idea of leaving the club is it's too far of a stretch. Yeah. Well, and, and, and two, they get, assurances in the small environment. Oh no, no, he's, he's yeah. not changed. You got to understand that what we're doing here. This is a, yeah. this is a mission thing. And uh, you know, it's like, we can't say that stuff from the stage, but you, just trust me, just you know. hang on. It's not, <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times I've been like, you know, trust me, bro. It's, he's still super conservative. Like, mm. <laughs> if you have to keep telling somebody that maybe what they're saying from the platform is more representative than you'd like to believe. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. we've, we've mentioned Andy several times. Um, there are a lot of examples, Hybels, um, Rick Warren, um, we could go down the list of, of mega church pastors who have drifted in a certain direction. Um, you know, I, I, a, a liberal direction. Mm -hmm. What I have some thoughts on why that is. I, I'm curious if you've, if, if there's something within the megachurch system that causes that, uh, why, why do you think we're, we see so much of that? I think there's a couple of things. Uh, I do believe that some of the early founders were truly liberal themselves, and they understood the church moment that they were in, 
and how slow of a game plan they needed to invoke. I can look back now and see the Global Leadership Summit that Willow put on every year that was by far the most influential two to three days in the mega church Mm -hmm. every single year for decades. Heibel at the time was a closet Democrat. It is obviously well now known now. He's he's just a liberal. And he was using the the leadership summit over the course of decades to subtly move the church to the left. And so um, I do think that was a big part of it, that the, the guys who were training at the top were doing that. Okay, now I think another part of it is, and I would I would label this as one of the unintended consequences, is that the church became doctrinally emaciated. And as, as doctrine deteriorates, um, I mean, just read the scriptures, right? When truth disappears, you're going to be prone to move leftward. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think over time, a lot of people who were conservative before, they lost core doctrine and, and, and they just naturally became lefties as, they, um, as their doctrine got weaker and weaker, right? Yeah. And, and so I think that was part of the system as well. Um, and then I think the other thing is, don't underestimate the fact that as as you were as the church was trying to create the mega church model you had to do two things in order to make it succeed one you didn't need a shepherd preacher leader you needed a chief executive officer mm-hmm. and so it attracted different people into pastoring these churches who were then trained by left leaning people and so when you combine those two things together, you go, well, this is not really that surprising. Secondarily, though, what you needed to make the mega church work is you needed unbelievable creatives. You needed, you mm. needed um, creatives in your non-stage team, and then you needed creatives on your stage. And um, I mean, it's no secret. A lot of the um, more creative people lean left. And so... Um, when character was no longer um, the standard for why you looked for a worship leader, a guitarist, a singer, or a drummer, I used to always joke, if you want a job for life, just learn how to play drums and do videos. You'll (laughs) always have a job. And when you're doing that, you attract people, particularly younger people who are not well-discipled or well-trained, who have these now more liberal heroes. They then infiltrated the megachurch and many more conservative lead pastors for the sake of preserving unity on their church staffs um, mm-hmm. bowed to COVID. Why? Because half of their staff is liberal. And if they, if they didn't tell everyone to get a shot, had they kept leave or kept meeting during COVID, um, all of their liberal musicians would have walked out on them. Mm-hmm. And so they had to, um, for the sake of unity, um, bow to their younger, more liberal leaning employees. Yeah, no, that was a huge thing. Uh, I remember when uh, Obama was first running, I, I just shocked yep. at ha- how many people on staff were supporting. I'm like, whoa, what, <laughs> what's going what on What happened? Here? Yeah. Yep. It was the first time in my life I knew serious Christians who were excited when the blue uh, you know, map showed up. And you're mm-hmm. like, wait, no, this, that's bad. We're red. We're not blue. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. Um, yeah. It, it, I wonder too if if something. Well, I I tend to think that one of the things that we saw happen, and I think this is what directly led to the unhitching the Bible or the Old Testament, mm-hmm. is I think the view of of evangelism was all about removing obstacles. Yep. You know, Andy used to do the old couch thing, like look around your church and and you know you don't see the old couch because it's been there forever, but the the guest sees that old couch. You need to look around, toss out the old couch and do what you can to to get rid of those obstacles that that keep someone away from the gospel. I think they've been they had been doing that for so many years, long enough to see kids that grew up in their church walk away from the faith. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, really rocked their world. I think a lot of mega churches were like, wait a minute, we we figured out church. We created the perfect church where that's not supposed to happen. And it's still happening. And so then it was like, okay, let's talk to them. Why are you leaving? What don't you like? And it was our, you know, biblical teaching on sexuality. It was, you know, our our politics. It was, you know, you know, your support of Black Lives Matter or lack of support. 
And, and so then it was like, okay, we got to throw off other things. These things are still obstacles. And so Andy has like reduced, you know, being a Christian purely down to, do you believe the resurrection? Cool. You're, you're a Christian. You don't have to, <laughs> everything else, yep. it, it's not important. It just toss it over. And it's this idea of just remove the obstacles, remove the obstacles. Well, when we, when we make the Great Commission about simply raising your hand during your Christmas Eve mm-hmm. service, then we're, we're setting ourselves up for exactly what you described. And the Great Commission, instead of making disciples and teaching them everything that, you, uh, you know, that, that, that they were taught, became go and make converts, go make people who will raise their hand this Christmas Eve and then next Christmas Eve and then the Christmas Eve a- after that. And, um, and so, like you said, early on the obstacles, Andy wasn't wrong. Sure. Like you don't have to do a kid's program at your biggest service of the year that nobody really wants to watch except for grandma. So get rid of it. That's not biblical, um, to do or not to do. But over time, those obstacles came from man-made traditions that we are biblically instructed to get rid of it when we need to, and to not be in a hindrance to the gospel. But those, those over time came biblical value, biblical truth. Ah, they're mm-hmm. just a hindrance. And so get rid of it. Yeah. Um, what role, um, you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Aaron Wren's uh, negative mm-hmm. world framework that we've, we're previously in a neutral world, which is really where, I think the the mega church just exploded. It was during that yep. time where like we we the church was kind of a, a sales and marketing for Jesus. Like we're yeah, you know, we've got to present all the benefits. Uh we're gonna do it in a fun, exciting way. You come and hear it. What what has the transition into negative world uh done to the mega church? Well, um, so I've got a I've got a book coming out later this year, and the um, the subtitle is Effective Church Leadership in the Post-Megachurch Era. Mm-hmm. And what post-megachurch era, or the aftermath of the megachurch, um, is evaluating, okay, the megachurch, in my opinion, it died on whatever that was, March 11th, 2020. And its leg is still shaking, um, but eventually... Um, rigor mortis is going to set in. It's going to be done. It's going to start stinking so bad that people are going to have to run away from it. And um, correctly overlaying those two things that the megachurch thrived in neutral world. Why? Because you were in, you, you're looking at people and saying, okay, you can choose A or B, and we're going to make A, the megachurch, as attractive as possible. Look, um, your sexual patterns don't matter. You get free coffee. It's going to make you happy and joyful. Your marriage is going to be better. Um, your time and your rhythm and your schedule is going to be better. Like choose us over that, right? You neutral person. And now I think as the megachurch transitions, and my theory is that on, on that day when the megachurch died, a new era of the American church began. I think it's going to last 40 years, just like the last one did. Um, the term I used to describe it is the post-denominational era. Um, the era where we're, we're merging out of the megachurch and out of, um, not that denominations are all going to disappear, but generally speaking, we are now in an era of returning back to core orthodoxy and unifying around the core doctrines of the faith, returning to our more ancient or classical practices of our faith. And where the megachurch is refusing to do that, it's actually, which is, which is funny because its whole point is to be attractional um, and to be relevant. Um, it's actually um, diverging from where culture as a whole, I believe, is moving, which is a return to more ancient thought and practice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I also wonder if there's going to be kind of a, uh, I don't know, a negative world uh, attractional model that understands that, you know, people are hungry for truth. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think of someone like uh, Ryan Fisconti in, uh, uh, I yep. think he's Arizona. Uh, who is really yeah, kind of Phoenix embraced. Era. Yeah. So he's really kind of embraced this. No, we're going to do everything opposite of what we're doing, but keep it in yep. the you know, trappings of the, the mega church. And I think his church is exploding because people are craving that they're looking for a place that will share the truth. And I, I, I guess my, my worry there is that we don't learn the lessons that the post mega church, uh, 
you know, era has to teach us because we've just uh, we've just found something else that is attractional. And, and so, I wish. Yeah, go ahead. Well, well, so I think that's I think that's astute. I think what we have to do and what we have to understand is we have to ask, OK, what do we need to bring in from the era and what do we need to not bring in? Um, because I think there's there are valuable lessons that we need to bring with us from the megachurch era. Joy is a good thing. Um, mm. Relevance without compromise is a good thing. Excellence is a good thing. These are all things that we can. Leadership is a fine thing. It's a fine trait. These are all things we need to bring with us into the megachurch era. But I think what we can, or I'm sorry, into the into the post denominational era. But I think what we um, also need to do is we need to learn from the other elements of evangelicalism and say, well, okay, hold on. What do we need to bring with us from those? So the, the more mainline historical or traditional church, what are the traits we need to bring in from that era? What do we need to bring in from the, I call them the charismatics or the quasi charismatics. What do we need to bring in from there? And to me, the post-denominational church is going to be defined as being um, these four things, um, theologically sound, professionally excellent, um, uh, experientially rich, and culturally engaged, all four of those things, um, because I think those are taking the best from all of our history and the more recent pillars of American evangelicalism and say, okay, we've got some history now. Let's learn from that. Let's bring it all in. And I think all four of those things speak directly to negative world. We have to be theologically sound because we live in a post-truth era. We have to be experientially rich um, because people are, we say this all the time, they're looking for experiences now, right? Um, and so we have to have that. Um, we have to be culturally engaged because the non-believer that looks at the church and goes, the world's going to hell and you guys don't care, can see through that, right? Um, and we have to be professionally excellent um, because we live in a modern world. No one wants to walk in with your clip art, um, you know, and, and everything else. Like, hey, it's 2024. Let's act like it. And so you bring all of those things together. And I think there's a powerful church. I think that's what I think that is what Ryan is experiencing. Um, our church, we've grown 5x in the last four years. Um, and and it's and it's just by in many ways, we're exactly the same as we were in 2019. The world has just changed around us. Yeah, and Joe Rigney um, has talked a lot about um, uh, living under the progressive gaze. I think that was yeah. something that characterized the the, yeah. the megachurch world. It, you know, uh, I know uh, Willow Creek got into a lot of trouble for kind of embracing the homo, homo I can't even say it hom homo homogenous unit principle, uh, yeah. where you zero in on a target. This is who our church is for. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people backed away from that. Oh, you were just trying to reach white people in the suburbs. Um, but a, a version of that still exists in a lot of these churches where they're they're It feels like they're just trying to reach leftists. Um, how do how do we go forward in this new negative world without, um, you know, how, how do you do that? Because I've I've been thinking a lot about contextualization and, and, you know, Tim Keller would say that you've got to contextualize the gospel to the audience that you're trying to reach. But in our multicultural world, um, you know, you could be plant a church in New York City, but there's going to be people in and around this, you know, the circumference of your church that are a wide range of beliefs. And so anytime you try and contextualize to a specific type of person, you're choosing not to make church for the other people. And, and how do we navigate that going forward? So if we believe Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and then to the Greek. And we have to um, hopefully present a gospel that, that truly does transcend culture and time. Now, I don't believe that, um, that all contextualization is bad. We do need to understand the environment that we're preaching into, teaching into. I need to understand being in a predominantly white, upper middle class suburb, um, you know, what it, what it looks like, what are the, the pinch points for people in my church, uh, and those types of things. Um, but I, um, I, I think that when you get back to the, uh, we call it clear truth, when you get back to the unfiltered word of God, 
um, you do begin to realize that it it does it transcends it transcends. And what's interesting about Keller is Keller was the guy who taught this best in his literalism sermons and 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 writings um, that like the the word of God is always going to offend a certain culture um, because it is the word of God. And you, it proves that it's the word of God, that it offends you at some point, otherwise you would be God. And, and so I think where maybe one of the things that we're going to leave behind uh, in, the, in, the, in the megachurch era, we're going to leave behind caring if we offend people. And um, if we don't bring in the fear of man with us, um, and, we, and we really do just uh, adhere to the fear of God, and we preach the, the fullness of the word of God, um, then I think that can tra- transcend culture. Um, let me tell a quick story. Uh, I was a part of a group that brought the Global Leadership Summit to um, uh, Spanish-speaking countries. And so every year we would go down, and, and this was back in the late 2000s, so this technology was relatively bad, um, and you know it was dubbed over, all of that kind of stuff. Every time I would do this, the leadership talks would fall flat. Every time. I'd sit there and I'd look at these Spanish speaking crowds and I'm like, this is just bad. Uh, but every once in a while, even at the leadership summit, they would invite a John Ortberg or somebody who would actually preach and teach the Bible. And I would sit there and I would watch that leadership summit that had started in Barrington, Illinois to a bunch of um, Chicago left leaning libs, um, you know, worth millions, um, cut through and communicate deeply um, to impoverished people in Spanish speaking third world countries. Um, why? Because the gospel does that. Mm -hmm. I think we dressed it up so much in topical perspective that we stripped it of its power Mm -hmm. and the topical teaching can be effective to a homogenous group of people. Um, every middle class or upper middle class person that I am communicating to is worried about their kids in a woke school or whatever. And so I can preach topically to that, um, but, or I can teach underneath it and, and just preach the fullness of the word of God. And it will, it will hit my people and it'll hit everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Um, well, I don't want to keep you forever, but I like to end my conversations, um, just by asking what is something that's giving you hope right now? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think what um, is giving me hope is that the Holy Spirit is doing the same thing all over. And I tell our church all the time, I never want to be the only people doing something. And uh, and so whether it's uh, Jamie Bambrick in in Northern Ireland or it's Andrew Sedra in Australia, um, or uh, you know all of our Clear Truth personalities across the country, um, I had a conversation on Friday with um, a, a pretty famous megachurch era pastor um, and have a, had a conversation with him. And it was the exact same stuff um, and the language. And there's no one guiding the language right now, which is why it's really cool. There is no Andy Stanley hero telling us all to say the same thing. Um, it, it really is right now. It's just the Holy Spirit um, that is driving up this same stuff. And so that's what's giving me hope right now is that the Holy Spirit, he's doing the same things. He's, uh, there's these churches that are, that are committed to the clear truth or the unfiltered word of God that are committed to taking over education again, that are committed to building new institutions and entities, um, that are committed to returning to the ancient truths that are committed to unifying around core doctrine. And we don't even have a central database right now telling us to do this. It's just the Holy spirit. Uh, and so to me, that's, that's exciting. That is yeah, very much so. I think there's a ton of opportunity right now, and I want to be part of the generation that is that God's using to to harvest the the fields that are white. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're not having fun right now in ministry, you're not doing it right. Because yeah. I mean, it is just an unbelievable opportunity um, to to speak the truth. I was having a conversation today with a guy. I said somebody could show up in our town right now. And um, if they could just preach the word, they could put people on pews, sing a hymn with an old lady at a piano and grow their church Mm. Um, because people are emaciated. People are looking for food and we have a church and a country that is doctrinally emaciated. And so any appetizer of the word of God and people will gravitate. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you, Stephen. I have enjoyed this. Where can people find you? 
Um, so they can find uh, a lot of my work at cleartruthmedia.com um, and then our church website, experienceredemption.com. Uh, and then I'm fortunate enough that I think on every social channel, I just have my name, just Stephen Whitlow. So nice. go find me. Awesome. Well, uh, I appreciate this. Uh, have a great day. Thanks for having me, Josh. That's our show for today. Big thanks to Stephen Whitlow for joining me for this conversation. Uh, be sure to subscribe to everything they do over at Clear Truth Media. They make great content, and I really want to support all that they're doing uh, to kind of provide an alternative to uh, the Gospel Coalition that's not afraid to really tackle a lot of the cultural issues we're seeing. So I'm a big fan of what they're doing, and uh, you should go support that. Now, if you found this episode helpful, please share it with a friend. Uh, go ahead and hit like and subscribe so you don't miss future content. If you're listening, uh, go ahead and uh, leave us a review over at Apple Podcasts. Those are always appreciated. Till next time, I will talk to you soon.